Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. And thank you uh, to everyone who's here this morning. It's early, so hopefully you've gotten your coffee. So today we're going to be talking about consumption. But I think consumption is going to take sort of a different angle. Um, we have some great speakers. You know, I got a chance to speak to some of the fellows and some of the old folks who've been around coffee for a while done yesterday. And we're all kind of excited and frustrated at the same time as to where we are. And as we look at the U.S. and we look at our coffee consumption in the U.S. and we notice that over the past few years, past seven years, coffee has actually been unchanged. But what about that unchanged that we're not seeing? What's behind the numbers? Where might there be opportunities that we have yet to discover? So that's some of what we will talk about today. Letting go of sameness. Let's see. So maybe there's some growth in product categories, different products that have not been developed. Maybe there's some growth in minority groups who are not big consumers of coffee. Maybe there's some opportunities in producing countries. So this morning, I'm really happy to have a couple individuals who's going to join me on stage. Keba Conte, he's from Red Bay Coffee in Oakland, California. He traveled all the way here. Keba focuses on engaging non-traditional specialty coffee consumers, people of color, particularly African Americans, who often fall short in consumption. Those who were formerly incarcerated, women, the disabled. Keba sees the future of coffee as being highly inclusive. Vera Espindola Raphael. Vera is a researcher and developer. She's also new to the SCA board. Vera is going to talk to us about this whole idea of giving more value to the, to the producer. And how do you do that? Do you do that by growing coffee consumption? Well, it seems that we're talking about some really long-range ideas, but I think that it's time that we start to dig deep into some of these topics of increasing consumption through either minority groups, through producing countries, but give, giving more value to farmers. So just for a few minutes, I'd like to show you some of the data as far as the U.S. is concerned regarding consumption. And most of my, all of my data is going to come from the National Coffee Association's National Coffee Data Trends. It's the oldest coffee survey in the United States. It started in 1950 when uh, surveyors would go door to door to find out what people were drinking. So as you can see, over the last seven years, coffee has pretty much remained the same, in and around 60%. But the exciting thing for the specialty coffee industry, of which gourmet coffee is part of the category um, in, involved in this survey, you can see that there has been somewhat of a decline in what we call non traditional coffee or non-gourmet, where there's been an incline in gourmet coffee. So that should be good news to specialty people. But we can't lose sight that the last three years has actually plateaued. The survey looks at the number of cups that are consumed on a daily basis by those they, they survey. So the good news for specialty people is that in the US, more consumers year over year are drinking more specialty coffee versus traditional coffee or gourmet coffee, as the survey says. Well, what about age and type of coffee? We probably all kind of knew this, I think. Younger people tend to drink more gourmet coffee. Older people drink more traditional non-gourmet coffee. So last year, I got a chance to speak at RICO. And I threw out this crazy idea that there was really a lack of involvement in the coffee industry by minority groups. I don't see many minorities in coffee in the US. And I felt that the way to engage minorities more would be to bring them into the industry as, as not just as consumers, but as entrepreneurs, as leaders, as employees of companies. Well, what happened is um, a few other people thought the same thing. 
William Fry, who's the author of Div Diversity Explosion, said that youthful minorities are the engine to the future. There's 35% 35, 35 of, of the U.S. is made up of three ethnic minority groups, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Asian Americans. That's 130 million people. In the next 26 years, the U.S. demographics will change dramatically. And so for the first time, according to the 2017 census, the U.S. will have 49.7% Caucasian Americans. We will have an increase in, multiracial, in our multiracial population, Asian Americans, and a small in, uptick in all the other ethnic groups. While Hispanic Americans typically are among the highest coffee consumers, um, as I said earlier, African Americans has always lagged behind, but the most exciting news that came out of the National Coffee Association's NCDT uh, survey this year was that African Americans are now on par with not just coffee consumption, but with gourmet coffee consumption. African Americans have closed the gap. That's exciting. It's not just coffee, it's gourmet coffee, it's good coffee, it's the coffee that, that helps uh, the whole industry. So what do those numbers look like? I'm gonna go back. So if we look at um, past week consumption, you can see for 2017, 2018, we African Americans were hoovering around a little over 40%, close to 50%, but jumped over 51% this year. Asian Americans and Hispanic Americans remain pretty constant, um, but we are seeing things um, move in that area. Uh, it is because of young ethnic minorities that the gourmet coffee sector is growing. As you can see, Caucasian Americans actually dropped. The number, based on percentage of those survey, dropped from 40, 42, 41 to 39. And researchers said that they actually do consider this a drop. But I want to give recognition to those who have done some work. And I feel that, you know, I would be remiss without saying that I've noticed as an African-American who's worked in coffee for the last 20 years and seeing very little representation, I have seen a shift towards becoming a more inclusive industry in the U.S. And I hope that regardless as to what country you're in, that you also take note to see who else is not at the table. It's more than just the woman. It's the indigenous people. It's the different groups that make up your community and your society. So I would really like to give acknowledgement to the SCA, who I think has put together its most diverse board that I've ever seen. I was probably the first woman of color who uh, served on their board. This year they have many, so I'm very pleased to see that. The industry has, has taken a role in talking about diversity and inclusion issues, and I'm happy to see that. But yes, we have a long way to go. We need diversity that extend beyond your production area, but in decision-making roles. As society becomes more and more diverse, there's a need to have that perspective at the table. So this leads me into my next conversation. I get to sit down for a moment with a practitioner, Keba. Keba Conte, the uh, individual that I mentioned earlier. And Keba, as I said, joins us from um, Oakland, California, a place where there's tremendous gentrification. And uh, he has a focus on an industry, on a part of the industry uh, that helps to improve consumption among people of color. Keba, would you please come to the stage? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. For coming. Thanks. It's good so nice. To be here. Good. It's yeah. good to have you here. Yeah. Hello, Boston. <laughs> Hello, coffee people. Yeah. So tell us about <clears throat> tell us about Red Bay. Tell us about your mission. Yes, um, well, Red Bay Coffee, we, found, we were founded five years ago. Um, 
after me spending 10 years in the coffee industry uh, as a cafe owner, owned a couple cafes, and then got into the roasting and side of it. Um, our, our, our tagline is beautiful coffee to the people. <laughs> and um, what I mean by beautiful is uh, beautiful coffee is, um, is specialty coffee. And not just, uh, you know, I mean, so specialty coffee is just, there's so much beauty in it. Um, I mean, you know, just in this lobby, you could see the equipment. Uh, you could see the tools of the trade. You could see this, the beautiful latte art, um, you know, moving back um, up the stream. You, you see those coffee cherries and the farmers. I mean, just the whole, there's just so much beauty built mm -hmm. into the whole thing. Um, but really what's at the heart of what I mean by beautiful coffee is really the relationships mm -hmm. and how we're moving um, coffee. Um, and to the people is really trying to make this beautiful coffee more approachable and more accessible to more people. Okay. So that has been our mission from the very beginning, trying to create uh, spaces that are more welcoming and, um, and really having the experience uh, the joy of, of, of specialty coffee, just wanting to share that with a broader audience. Um, and, and in order to bring more people into this industry, bring more um, uh, uh, customers uh, into experience, mm -hmm. um, these have more beautiful coffee experiences. Um, and that is about creating spaces. Uh, so that's, that's some of the things yeah. that we do. Yeah. So you must be excited about this new data um, surveys saying that more African Americans are drinking coffee. You're creating spaces that help to make people feel more comfortable in a space. Um, what has been some of the things that you've learned from having a, such a multicultural um, experience in your business and in your leadership? What are some of the things that you've learned from that? And what yeah. are some of the challenges that you have sure. with that? Well, the, yeah, the data is exciting. I, I just learned about this very recently. Um, so you're all welcome. Um, <laughs> but um, no, I, I'm just finding about this. So this is, this is really exciting. And, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I, I guess it affirms what, what I sort of knew or um, that, that um, you know, black people ni like nice things. And, um, and that do. if we are, as a community, um, giving the platform and, and giving welcoming spaces that um, we will take it on as our own. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's the distinction, right? So there's one thing to treat someone as a consumer mm. um, and, you know, because they're, you're, you're, you're always sort of uh, at arm's length, mm -hmm. right, as a consumer. But when, and the, and the you know, the, 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 that, the, that coffee drinker, you know, uh, feels that, that, that distance. Um, but when spaces and experiences are created uh, in a very authentic way mm -hmm. with um, the audience in mind, really, um, I think that allows opportunities to, to, to really be yourself, mm -hmm. um, to be your authentic self, to feel safe um, in the space. So, um, yeah, so that's been some of my experience. Um, I think in terms of the experience actually building um, this, this company, um, um, just to give you a little snapshot of, of where we are, we've, um, you know, we've been around for five years. We have about 35 employees. We do wholesale roasting. We have about five cafes, uh, you know, maybe 200 wholesale accounts. And um, you know we do we do um, about 200 events a year inside mm -hmm. of our space. We um, we do classes, we do workshops. Uh, some of the events are not all coffee centric, but maybe more value aligned, um, cultural aligned. Mm -hmm. Films, lectures, conversations, um, live music, and dance performance. Mm -hmm. So you know the culture is a very dynamic thing. It's evolving. Um, so, um, and to try to build and in, 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 in a, a diverse leadership mm -hmm. is really the challenge that uh, I put out to all of you 
uh, entrepreneurs and, you know, and, and, and founders and company owners today. Um, it's not, um, it's not j enough just to have sort of black and browning of the front line of your baristas, but that is important and that is an important first step because that's where you sort of get on the ladder mm -hmm. to, to grow with, within the industry. Um, but I, you know, my mission was to do more than that, right? Was to really create the leaderships the, in, the, in the marketing and the finance and the branding and, you know, and all of, and of course, in the coffee and the quality control. But if I'm entering into an industry that has not had a, you know, really a great track record of, uh, of that level of inclusion and, uh, and diversity, as I'm trying to hire and build these teams, there aren't a pool, a great pool of experienced people. So that's part of my challenge. So, um, you know, so, you know, that's often the excuse that many industries use, right? There's, uh -huh. you know, th there's a pipeline issue. Right, right. Um, so really how I think about that is, um, one, just if it's important to you, try harder, uh, be more intentional, um, um, you know, get creative. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, what, what I've done is I had to sort of um, go slightly outside of the coffee industry, but industries that I think might be relevant. Um, my first coffee director actually came from specialty chocolate. Hmm. Um, so, you know, he was roasting, you know, harvest. I mean, so really there's so many parallels with, with specialty chocolate. Um, you know, I also hired uh, people who had experience in bartending and, mm -hmm. and, um, and wine and chefs. So people who had defined palates, who understood flavor profiles, um, um, you know, so, and, and giving them an opportunity. Right. 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 So, so, so the, you know, that was my own, you know, practice. And, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to see over the last, you know, 15 years, mm -hmm. um, you know, in 2005 was when I first opened my first cafe. So um, I, I, I have seen the, you know, progress over the last five or six years. So, you know, although these stats are, are you know, very nice, um, it's not totally surprising. I, I think I, I right. saw it. Right. I think I saw it writing on the wall. Yep. Great. So there's a lot of people in the audience who are from coffee producing countries and feel the pains of the crisis and the low prices that we have now. And they may be thinking, black people drinking coffee, okay, but coffee prices are low and we need to fix that. Tell me, as, as an African American, what do you think, um, ha being, having the history of being an African American, living in this country, and understanding the crisis and the position of farmers, is there any correlation or opportunities that exist, even in the, in the realm of empathy, mm -hmm. that can take place that would help move the industry towards better solutions or better answers? So, I, you know, so um, African Americans, and I think really um, young, young people in general, so really the, the millennial generation, um, there's a stat that I read that 88% of, of millennials will actively boycott a brand that they feel um, is practicing unethical business. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, you know, that, that sentiment is, is uh, very much ingrained in the African American culture. Uh, because of, you know, so much discrimination throughout the history, throughout our history from, you know, from Jim Crow to redlining to, um, you know, just segregation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we're very sensitive to, um, to unethical business behaviors and we will, you know, very sort of uh, passively boycott and actively boycott. Um, so it's, uh, we, we saw that last year, you know, um, you know, with, you know, around, around the coffee industry when, you know, when two men are, were arrested in, in Philadelphia um, for, you know, just going into a coffee shop. So, so these, this is just really just always just right there on the, on, on the cutting edge of it. Um, so, you know, I mean, and, and, and really coffee is interesting because coffee is uh, one of these industries like, cotton or sugar, 
um, it's a commodity that was really founded um, with slave labor. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very complex history for us. Um, you know, so, so you know, we, we, we do have um, empathy when it comes to um, people's labor being exploited, uh, which, is, which is part of this coffee crisis. Um, and, you know, and obviously this coffee crisis has a lot of different, it's a very complex global, you know, economic challenge. But we can't let that overwhelmingness of, of, mm -hmm. of the problem, you know, really stump us from, from addressing it from where, wherever we are, wherever we address uh, coffee, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we can have um, a say-so in it. Um, so, uh, so yes, there's there's empathy for it. You know, um, I think you know, um, as as uh, Vera will will speak on later. I, you know, really the growing consumption in um, in producing countries, mm -hmm. I think, um, has a tremendous long term value to help break the chains of the coffee crisis. Right. Uh, right. By the, by gaining more self determination, um, and and consumption and, and creating industries with, within our own community. Okay. Um, I just want to let you know that the clock is stopped, so we're going to just talk for the next six hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so yesterday we were having a conversation, and um, you corrected my language because I said when I visited your, your cafe, I got a chance to taste some beautiful coffees, Brazil, Burundi, from all over the world. And uh, I was talking about the supply chain and how it's important that um, your company keep an eye on the supply chain. And he challenged my use of the word supply chain. And I, I'd like for you to yeah, share so, your perspective. Yeah, so, you know, so, um, you know, we talk about sort of the, the historic, um, in the, 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 how slavery, the role slavery played in the history of coffee. And, and um, of course, uh, slavery's cousin uh, colonization. So, you know, really we, we think about language a lot about because language is really how you think about problems. Just the language is in, ingrained in, in, in all of it and how um, it's going to hard, it's going to be very difficult to create solutions using the same thinking that created the problems. Um, so, you know, we're always, uh, as part of the culture at Red Bay, we're, we're trying to decolonize the process. So, you know, um, for instance, you know, um, I mean, even using the word chains, you know, uh, is really loaded and impactful. So we think about um, value, I mean, the streams. So, yeah, so in, in our company, we, we talk about value streams um, and not just sort of, a, you know, we're getting the supply and where the supply is moving from place to place, but what, what value um, is that, and you know, and, and you know, just as the metaphor of a stream is so much more beautiful than a chain. Yeah, um, you I know, agree. And, and, and I think it's even more apt because um, streams, you know, have rivers and other conduits, and and they, and they stream, you know, they, they break off. They have alternatives. They have alternatives. They pool. They dam. I mean, it's so it's so much more dynamic than a chain. Yeah, the chain is linked. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> Not always a good thing. Uh huh. Good, good. Well, it's um, I'm I'm looking at your photographs here, and um, you know I've been to some cafes in the most diverse places, and I've never seen this level of uh, diversity. Um, when I visited your cafe, um, you know, you think an African American uh, company. It would be filled with African American people drinking beautiful coffees, but that's not necessarily the case. I remember I came in early that morning and you had your dog and the guests who came in, they were not just black people. They were all sorts of people who felt comfortable in your cafe. Um, and so I think the message, and I think the message is when you start to be inclusive, it really is inclusive. Yeah. Everybody feels welcome to come. Um, yeah, think about jazz music or the blues or hip hop or 
Black Panther, the movie, you know what I mean? Things that are very yeah. unapologetically black um, are still, they're, they're still powerful and, and very rich forms of art uh, and culture. And that goes for spaces. Mm -hmm. um, that goes for flavor profiles that, you know, so, um, so when, 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 um, when we create uh, spaces like that, it's, you know, it's, it's really a welcoming, approachable space. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and that's, that is what I've noticed, that, that um, by creating a space like that, it attracts everyone. Goodbye. Everyone wants to be, you know, in, in, in that space. Um, oh. And, you know, and I use diversity um, in, in different contexts, but, you know, so with, at Red Bay Coffee, we, you know, we, we do have a big Africa on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, as, as, as an homage to the birthplace of coffee, uh, Ethiopia, as, um, as an opportunity to uh, really understand and help foster the link between African Americans and Africa, um, which is important mm -hmm. because, you know, for, you know, in, back to the question of, you know, um, helping. Uh, African Americans embrace specialty coffee. Like, how do you make it relevant? Like, what does that have to do with with me? What does coffee have to do? So, so my argument is that well, coffee is the birthplace of Africa. You know, as a continent, it's still one of the most productive um, continents um, producing coffee. And you know, as as African Americans, we can see that as our heritage. Mm. Um, and if we were to, um, so, so on, on, on one level, it's our heritage. Um, so let's embrace that, enjoy the coffee as a, as a cultural, um, as, a, as, a, as a cultural nod. We can also, on a business level and on entrepreneurial, we could look at it um, as an inheritance. Mm -hmm. And inheritance, um, you know, very linked to heritage is, um, inheritance is something that, is you know is 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 about is financial, um, it's cultural, it's sort of a you know a family heirloom, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, it's pride. It, it's pride, right? Yeah. So yeah. so so I uh, that's that's why you see that Africa there. You know we've got you know um, pictures of of you know famous black people drinking coffee. We've got T-shirts that say. Um, uh, coffee, Africa's gift to the world. You're welcome. Yeah. We have coffees that say "Black Coffee" uh -huh. T-shirts that say that. So, so you know, we are not we're not trying to be everything to everyone, uh -huh. but we're trying to be our our authentic selves, and we see that that is been embraced mm -hmm. by many. Great, great. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we could talk forever. I, I think I may have about three more minutes uh, to conversate um, before we have to move on. Mm -hmm. um, but I noticed we do have um, a lot of African farmers who attend the Specialty Coffee Association activities, and they really don't know African Americans. Um, they don't have any idea of who they are or they don't understand their, their drinking habits. So uh, there, would you agree that there may be some opportunities for connections to form, you know, all over the world, Brazil, Africa, oh, all sure. over the world? Yes, oh, absolutely. Um, just yeah. in understanding each other culturally. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's been, that's been an ongoing uh, movement, um, you know, ever since um, emancipation. Mm -hmm. You know, really, and, and, and I would say there's even been an active uh, campaign to disassociate uh, Africa from Afri African America. And um, so I think it's, you know, um, in our common interest, um, continental African farmers and producers and people to, to, to African Americans. So, you know, since sort of really the 60s and 70s was really the sort of the height of trying to draw our cultures together. Um, and that's a movement that goes on today. There's, you know, a really a resurgence uh, with 
you know, the, even younger than millennials, the, the generation following them who are really understanding travel, global travel, yes. um, making trips to Ghana, making trips to Senegal and to Kenya. Um, so, so this is a movement that's happening. Um, and, um, you know, so I know a generation or two, you know, there was a lot of misunderstanding um, on both sides. Um, but I think that's been fed with, you know, we, we've been fed misinformation. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's that which is sort of a divide and conquer. Right. Right. Um, you know, so now we're going to sort of unite and defend. And <laughs> um, so I'll leave it at that. All right. Uh -huh. Good. All right. Thank you, yeah. Keva. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you.